Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today, we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. Well, hello, folks. I am Hank Sheffer, and I'm known as the old storyteller. And the first story I got to tell you is how that came about, why they call me that. At Apache Land, many years ago, uh, part of my job was to haul this rocking chair out in the middle of the street at the beginning of all the shows, and I'd sit there with my book in hand, and I would read stories to the people, and then we would have a gunfight after that. So that's exactly what I'd like to do today is, is redo some of that. I want to read you a couple stories, just like they were in the old days. Well, now, I have said in our mission statement that there would be times when we will present legends and lore and stories, and sometimes pretty fantastical stories. They are simply occurrences that have been passed along around campfires and perhaps overindulged whiskey bars. Nevertheless, they are very much integral parts of the Superstition Mountain legacy. The interpretation of these stories now is only limited to how deeply you allow your imagination to delve into their suspicious, if not sometimes superstitious nature. Now that said, hang on to your hat. This story is, actually did take place. Finding Bigfoot, not so much. Many years ago, a call was received by one of our local historians in the junction from a Mr. C. Thomas Biscardi from over there in Northern California. Now, in case you don't know who this guy was, because I didn't either, uh, Carmen Thomas Biscardi, known as Tom, is a cryptology enthusiast, a Las Vegas promoter, an internet radio host, and a film director. He describes himself as a real big foot hunter. He was interested in a Yeti and a Bigfoot in Rivas Valley, a landlocked biotic area above the Sonorian Desert floor that supported dense ponderosa pines. It means that this area was where adaptations ensure the animals can survive. It's a place where Bigfoot could survive. And Mr. Biscardi wanted to know how to get there. Well, that came as a surprise to pretty much everybody in the junction. A story about Bigfoot in the superstition wilderness was ridiculous at best, especially for people who had been in and out of the mountain and who knew most of the rocks on a first name basis up there. But then it was recalled there was another tale about a strange encounter more than 80 years prior to that, when two prospectors hiked into the area around Pope Springs they were in search of gold, like pretty much everybody else was. Pup Springs is about a mile and a half southeast of Rogers Trough Trailhead. The two prospectors were all settled in when one night something attacked the camp. Whatever was killed and hauled off their burrow before they could fire a shot must have been something. Both men said that they got a good look at the huge beast as it dragged their burrow off. But after that, they stayed up, wide awake, too scared to go to sleep. They kept trying to figure out how big an animal would have to be to carry off a 450-pound burrow. In their mind's eye, it almost had to be a grizzly bear. That was the biggest critter out here capable of doing such a deed. The only problem was there weren't grizzly bears out here. They were mostly black bears. But they get big, too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Later, when the prospectors were pressed by the newspapers to describe their uninvited intruder, they said it was large, smelly, strange sort of an animal with matted, coarse, and tangled hair. They said it was tall. They said it was every bit of eight to 10 feet tall. Although they couldn't actually identify the beast as an animal or a human, they said that it smelled like, sh uh, uh, well, you know what bears do. And it was unusually agile on its back feet. They guessed it weighed between 400 and 800 pounds. It was these two stories that probably fueled the imagination of Tom Biscardi, the real Bigfoot hunter. 
Well, here we go. On May 11, 1981, see, it's not all that long ago, the Phoenix Gazette announced Explore plans to capture Bigfoot. Now, C. Thomas Picardy was making an exploration trip to the Superstition Mountain in Arizona to search for Bigfoot. The interviews must have been something to witness. Biscardi claimed his latest encounter with Bigfoot occurred on Mount Lason in North California. He said he took photographs of the elusive primate, but admitted the front view images of the large hairy figure emerging from the clump of trees in the dark may not be enough to convince skeptics. He went on to say that there were more than 850 sightings of creatures matching the descriptions of Bigfoot in the Soviet Union, Canada, and the United States. Bacardi planned to prove their existence to be true and said he believed these creatures could be the possible link. He didn't say to what, he just said they were a link. Now, Mr. Biscardi now had two reports of these large human-like creatures in the superstition wilderness. He spent two weeks in the Rivas Ranch area, but reported not seeing anything. He did, however, report finding signs of Bigfoot. He pointed out some ponderosa pines with scratch marks 13 feet up, and that the ground indicating a, a tall animal must have been the one scratching that tree. Biscardi also stated there was a sour, sweet smell associated with Bigfoot. This smell was reportedly found in several locations around the Rivas Ranch. I must interject here, I, I gotta say this. First off, the scratch marks on the ponderosa pines could have easily been caused by black bears as they were very prevalent in the Superstition Mountains at that time. They weren't grizzlies. Black bears would often climb the pines just like little kids out playing and slide down the trunks using their claws as brakes. That would explain how those scratches got there. And secondly, anyone who has ever been to Rivas Ranch orchard fields could tell you that they could smell the sweet and sour smell of those apples on the ground before they ever got to the ranch. The wild critters up there just loved all those apples on the ground. Biscardi's expedition may have been a serious attempt to prove the existence of Bigfoot up in the superstitions. But Tom had to say that his expedition was disappointing. Bigfoot was now nowhere to be found. In the final analysis, or excuse, whatever you want to call it, he concluded that the wilderness area was not large enough to support a population of these unknown creatures. He went on to say that he never found Bigfoot. But that wasn't the end of the reported sightings of the elusive creature. Now, Tom had already left, he was gone, but there were also other reports. In the fall of 2000, there was a report that said, while, rep while riding horseback north of Rivas Ranch, a large black bear was spotted. The man who made the report said, if a person had any kind of imagination at all, they could have easily envisioned Bigfoot running across the old tall grass pasture. He looked just like a Bigfoot. And then a few years later after that, it was reported that a large upright animal spooked a rider and pack horse near the headwaters of Rough Canyon along the northern edge of White Mountain. This story surfaced about 15 years ago. And I can tell you the Rough Canyon area is extremely remote and ignored by most folks because it is almost impossible to get through the area. The rider who reported the large upright animal said he was trying to get to the headwaters of Rough Canyon to set up a camp and explore the area for archeological sites. He claimed that he was studying the pattern of inhabited areas north of White Mountain and south of Rebus Mountain. Well, and after, after that, there were several other sightings but they all turned out to be just as unsuccessful at finding and capturing Bigfoot as Tom Biscardi's endeavors had been. But make no mistake, my friends, the 250 square miles we call the Superstition Wilderness Area, with the Superstition Mountain right in the middle, 
has always been a region that attracted the unusual and unexplained. As it is with so many of the other legends and myths, if Bigfoot does exist, it remains to be proven. Turns out the superstitions are not the only place where things stay hidden. So in closing, let me say, as the years pass by, the superstitions continue to leave behind more questions than answers. And those interesting characters who we, we know about who explore the superstition wilderness are still chasing their dreams of finding lost gold, archeological treasures, learning about the flora and fauna, or just simply they're trying to figure out what is fact and what is fiction. And ironically, so much of it just sits right out there in front of us. Such is the case with the next story I'm going to tell you too. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. 